and then it's the oxaloacetate which is converted into phosphoenol pyrophate. This is how this reaction occurs. And this is thanks to the fact that this forward reaction is highly exothermic and cannot be bypassed the same way these other two reactions were actually done. Is this making sense as of now? Fantastic. Guys, if it doesn't make so much sense, remember what we do all the time. Go into the library, we make peace with these things. Come and ask questions, we can always elaborate. So, the three reactions when it comes to glycolytic intermediates would actually be circumvented in this fashion. Now, one of you is going to ask me to say, look, you mentioned that gluconeogenesis is production of glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. And you've only shown us the intermediates of glycolysis. What about the other non-carbohydrate precursors, right? Well, with this in mind, here are some of the non-carbohydrate precursors one would want to think about. The first one is lactate. This reaction in an aerobic condition will produce lactate. Guys, we showed this and we already know this is a reversible reaction. It's going to be catalyzed by lactate dehydrogenase, right? In fact, how this happens is that, well, when lactate has been produced in large amounts, what is going to happen then is that this lactate is going to be moved through the blood into the liver in a process referred to as the core cycle and it's in the liver that the lactate will be converted back into pyruvate and then the pyruvate will actually be converted to phosphoenol pyruvate through this series of steps and hence produce glucose. Remember, the blood glucose has to be maintained at the appropriate concentration in order for it to keep providing for the cells that predominantly use glucose as a source of energy, particularly brain. That clear? And you and I know that the entry of glucose into the brain does not depend on insulin, otherwise we wouldn't have any diabetics in existence, especially the type 1 type, right? It's actually going to just diffuse into the brain cells and hence the concentration of blood glucose should be high enough for it to continue diffusing into the brain. Is that clear? The other thing that one would probably want to think about is that, well, we mentioned triacyl glycerin. Allow me to just remove this stuff so that we narrow down to something. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's remove this stuff. Guys, for reference, for reference, I'll probably keep this these notes somewhere where you can access them. Access them. Is that okay? So I'll share with you a link so that you can go and access these notes for basic reference even as you are going to be writing your assessment. <laughs> All right. Oh, there are some that are not there when we discuss the assessment. We have good news. You are writing an assessment on Monday at 10 hours. So, have fun studying. <laughs> so now, we wanted to talk about the trimester of this room. Guys, when you look at triacyl glycerols in themselves, I want you to remember their structures. In general biochemistry, we showed that the triacyl glycerols would look something like this. They have a glycerol. The fatty acid chain attached like that. It goes this way most of the time, like that. Roughly, it looks something like this. 
triacyl glycerols. They will look something like this, and then it has a glycerol more on this side. Well, what is going to happen in a circumstance of starvation? <coughs> Guys, again, due to the low blood glucose, you have high amounts of glucagon being produced. Circumstances we already explained. High amounts of glucagon being produced means that glucagon would activate a number of enzymes leading to their phosphorylation and activation. One of the enzymes I mentioned to you last time was the enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase, right? This enzyme is actually found in the adipocytes, in the membranes of the adipocytes, where you store your triacyl glycerols largely. So these triacyl glycerols would then be broken down with the help of hormone sensitive lipase and other lipases. Once they are broken down, these phosphates, these are fatty acyl chains, fatty acids, the three of them are going to come out. When the three fatty acids have come out, you are going to remain with a glycerol molecule. The three fatty acids, once they have been removed, they are going to go into the process of beta oxidation, something we'll come and discuss going forward, and used for production of energy, right? So the free fatty acids would come out and be used for production of energy. The end product is glycerol. That's your end product. This is the glycerol. Alcohol, which is used to form the triacyl glycerols. How then is the glycerol going to be used to produce an intermediate of gluconeogenesis and be used as a source of energy? Well, first things first, this reaction is actually going to occur in the liver. So once the glycerol has been produced, it's going to be transported and gets into the liver, and it is in the liver where this glycerol is going to be used to produce an intermediate of gluconeogenesis. How does this happen? Well, the first thing is that this glycerol is actually going to be phosphorylated. This done of ATP, ADP, phosphate attaches there, and you have your product glycerol free phosphate. The enzyme is called glycerol free phosphate kinase. And this enzyme is just found in the liver. It's not found in the adipocytes. The next thing is that this glycerol free phosphate would undergo an oxidation reaction. Would you like me to remove this part, guys? Yes. Fantastic. So let's remove this part. So that I just show you what is going to happen next. Yeah. Okay. which would abstract that hydrogen and that hydrogen. The end product looks like this. The name of the end 
enzyme which is oxidizing this what do you think the name is going to end in it's removing hydrogens it's a what it's a dehydrogenase it's oxidizing oxidizing the substrate this are three phosphate dehydrogenase is the name of the enzyme removes this hydrogen and that hydrogen to form <coughs> this keto acid. This is called dihydroxyacetal phosphate. Familiar with dihydroxyacetal phosphate? Yes. Exactly. So, the next time you are asked, how then is glycerol or triacyl glycerols going to be used to produce an intermediate of glycolysis? You should be able to explain that glycerol is going to be first phosphorylated to glycerol to phosphate, then oxidized to dihydroxyacetal phosphate. Guys, be very clear. In the MCQs, you can be asked a question and then some of the some of the possible answers would be glyceroline phosphate, it would be dihydroxyacetone, then dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and things like that. Be watchful. Though glycerol sounds like glyceraldehyde, the end product is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Is that okay, guys? And that's how it's produced. Um, I think this would mark most of the things that you need to know. Why? because the rest of the things we had already explained in the TCS cycle. We explained that all the amino acids, or most of the amino acids, are actually going to be converted into the intermediates of the TCS cycle. We talked about uh, glutamic acid, glutamine, and arginine, all being converted into our keto glutarate in the last lecture. Then that would move up and be converted into glucose. Those are called genic amino acids, right? Propionyl CoA, branched amino acids such as isoleucine, and would all be converted into succinyl CoA, and hence be used to produce glucose in that way, right? The other thing I need to talk about amino acids such as tryptophan, amino acids such as alanine. <laughs> cysteine and serine, they are all able to be converted into pyruvate and then the pyruvate is going to move in its usual steps and lead to produce glucose. That explains how they are able to produce glucose from these non-carbohydrate precursors. I'm done. Any questions? As expected. Guys, enjoy studying. I'll see you Monday. <laughs>